Stanford University. Welcome to the seminar on people, computers, and design. Um, quick announcement. Next week, we have Jim Campbell, who's an electronic computer-based artist, does really interesting stuff. So it's a switch back from sort of the uh, nitty-gritty of how things happen in the HCI world to looking at some farther out questions of how you can apply stuff and, and uh, provoke people, as artists do. To last week, as you remember, we had Clara Shee, who was talking about the whole Facebook phenomenon and, and how it... Uh, has applications in, in all sorts of different areas, including business, that you might not have thought of. Uh, so this week, we're sort of following that up, but going, I, I would say, a step further, I think of it that way, uh, <laughs> looking at Twitter. And I just have to say, in terms of my own reactions, um, you, when I first looked at or heard about Twitter, my reaction was, well, that doesn't do anything I would want to do. <laughs> um, so why is it there? Um, and what I realized, in sort of including today at lunch, talking about lots of stuff, is that, um, first of all, the most obvious thing from ACI point of view, sometimes you don't know what you want to do until it becomes available, then you realize you wanted to do it. But the other is that when you create a very simple and broad platform, people will come up with all sorts of new creative ideas about what they want to do that are totally different from what you might, on the face of it, have thought it was used for in the first place. I mean, it's not just used for, you know, personal... Here's, my, here's I'm brushing my hair now, uh, but a whole bunch of other things. And going one step further, if you can design a platform that other developers can develop on, not only do users come up with things to do, but then the developers come up with new ways and so on. So the design, uh, which Alex will be talking about today, of the API is actually a key part of defining what the product is. I mean, mm -hmm. it really is how does it go out into the world through all the things people can build on top of it. So Alex Payne from Twitter will talk about it. All right. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks so much for being here. I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, I have to admit this is not my usual audience. Uh, I usually talk to rooms of professional programmers um, and uh, hackers, uh, security industry folks. Uh, that, that was my background before I, I uh, came to work at Twitter. And um, as a 25-year-old college dropout, it's a little intimidating to be speaking to a room full of people at Stanford. Um, but uh, hopefully you'll bear with me. Um, so my, my name is Alex Payne. And, um, I work at Twitter. Uh, if, you've, if you've never used it, Twitter is, um, we like to think of it as a, as a new communications medium. It's a way of moving short messages uh, from one person to many people. Um, and while there is a, a kind of standard uh, mode of interaction, um, which is you sign up via the website or a cell phone uh, and start talking about what you're doing, that, that's the prompt that we give you. What are you doing right now? Um, as people use the product over time, they tend to start answering other questions, finding different ways to interact with the product. And as our product has evolved over time, my job has become um, looking after our API. And I'll get into uh, what that is and how it works. Um, but just to give you kind of a broader sense of where I'm coming from, um, in my free time, uh, I write uh, a weblog. I write usually about technology, design, uh, particularly the Mac platform, because I think it's a really interesting conversion of, um, of design and aesthetics and technology. Um, I maintain an online scrapbook of um, sort of uh, a, a record of applied simplicity, I call it. Uh, it's called Minima. Um, and uh, I'm co-authoring a book on a programming language called Scala, um, and that will be available later this year. So my, my interests are really in um, what is the role of, of language in technology? What's the role of uh, a kind of minimalist aesthetic? Uh, how do you as effectively express uh, ideas programmatically? Um, so what's an API? Um, for, so, for some of you, this is an answered question, but uh, my understanding is it's kind of a, a diverse audience for these talks. So uh, an API 20 years ago basically meant uh, a library of software. It's the code that is not your code that your code is talking to. Uh, you have a goal in your program. There's this other body of code that can uh, take care of accomplishing that goal. So you call into it, uh, and it performs some task for you. It, it changes some state. It hands you back some data, that sort of thing. Uh, over the last few years, with the advent of web services, uh, when, when you say API, people think, 
uh, things like the Google Maps API or the Flickr API that lets you uh, upload and interact with information about this massive library of photos. Um, and now the, the Twitter API, wherein we expose everything that a user can do on our website uh, to programs. So why do we care about making good APIs? Presumably, if you have a bunch of code somewhere and it can accomplish a goal, that's good enough. Um, my uh, opinion in, in the few years I've worked in, in the programming industry is that tools really do matter. Um, one school of thought in uh, application development in, in uh, software engineering is that you shouldn't blame the tools and a good, a good programmer, a good craftsman can work on a terrible computer with a terrible development environment and ghastly APIs and if they're a good programmer they'll still produce a good program at the end of the day. And I, I think the, the lack of interest in computer science education, the fact that you know in, in most middle schools or high schools kids sit down to write their first program on an ugly old computer with an ugly old copy of you know the the uh, Visual Basic six and and have to you know develop their first program in this way with uh, libraries that have not had any thought put into um, the interaction design thereof. Um, the fact that that turns so many kids off of the craft of programming, I think, is is a demonstration of the value uh, in good APIs. Um, if you give people beautiful tools, they'll make beautiful things. And I don't think that code or, or software libraries are exempt from, um, from the possibility of being beautiful. So why does this matter to HCI professionals? Um, well, presumably in your career in HCI, you're going to end up writing some code. You're going to have to interact with APIs, be they um, those available locally on your operating system or some API out there on the web. And Essentially what I want this talk to be is the equivalent of uh, one of those crash courses in wine. So you go in and uh, you don't you know, end up being a sommelier at the end of the talk, but you, you can tell a good glass of wine from a bad glass of wine. And what I want you to be able to do at the end of this talk is tell a good API from a bad API. Uh, and what I want to explore are some qualities of good and bad APIs and define sort of several, several categories that will really help you suss out uh, is this an API that is appropriate for my project? Um, does it, if, if you're purchasing uh, access to a web service or you're, you're purchasing a software library to work with, is this going to be a good fit for uh, my business, for my research team? Um, and I, th I think this matters too because uh, HCI is such an all-encompassing discipline. It's, it's not just about uh, usability and, and drawing pretty graphical user interfaces. It's really figuring out how do, how do humans interact with computers effectively. And there are many, many humans who are programmers and the way they interact with their computer day in and day out is to work with these APIs. So perhaps we can improve them uh, and make their, their work and their lives better in the process. Um, I'm going to jump around to a bunch of different APIs, but I want to principally talk about what I know. Uh, and that is the, the Twitter API. So at this point, it's, it's two years old. Uh, it's sort of cropped up uh, in a very haphazard way. Um, Twitter has been built on a, a framework called Ruby on Rails. And this framework makes it very easy to uh, take some bit of behavior that you've written to uh, allow a user to click around a website and expose that as an API. Um, it's just a couple of extra lines of code to do so. And so rather than redirecting the, the user in their browser to some other page, you instead hand them back some data in a format like XML or RSS. Um, so initially, the Twitter API was essentially uh, a programmer at, at Twitter decided to throw in a few of these extra lines of code and put up a page on our site saying, we sort of have an API. If you can figure out what the URLs are, you can use it. Go build neat stuff. Uh, and for a while, that's sort of how we left it, um, because we had uh, things like keeping the website up and running to focus on. Um, but at, at the point where we started um, being able to sleep at night again, uh, we took some of our free time and, and went and actually documented the API and started to look at uh, what can we really turn this into. Um, and it was a side project of mine to kind of keep it up and running and to, and to encourage our developer community for quite some time. Uh, and then in the middle of the last year, it became uh, my full-time job because we kind of realized that the API in some ways was really uh, the leading way that people interact with our system. 
So we, we now have 40 methods uh, that comprise, as I said, basically uh, the entire scope of what a user can do uh, on the Twitter site uh, with just a couple of minor exceptions. Um, we also uh, have a search engine at search.twitter.com and that has a, a corresponding API. Uh, the two have slightly different behaviors as the search engine was something that, that we acquired and we're still in the process of kind of fully integrating into, into our system. Uh, so that's, that's kind of um, uh, an, an ugly point on, on our API at the moment. But um, essentially, you know, if you, if you want to tweet, if you want to follow people, block people, send them direct messages, search for tweets, um, all that kind of stuff, you can do it with our API. Um, we have uh, 4,500 developers across a couple of mailing lists. Um, there's over 5,000 applications that have identified themselves to us. Um, there's a couple of Japanese books about the API. There's one forthcoming from O'Reilly in English. Um, and we sort of like to say that there's this larger invisible ecosystem. There are developers who have never participated on our mailing list. They've never had any incentive to register their application with us. Um, but they've written projects that are out there on the internet. Uh, there are, you know, badges that tie into our uh, search service that are, that are running on sites. Uh, if you go to sites like CNN from time to time, they'll be integrating um, Twitter, uh, Twitter conversations about political topics, world news, that kind of thing. Uh, and those applications are, are never really identified to, the, to us. They're, they're just sort of out there on the internet running, uh, consuming our, our computational resources. Um, and so at, at this point, the API accounts for hundreds of millions of requests per day. Um, there, are, there are a lot of numbers out there on the web about how much traffic we really do. Um, and some of the more recent ones are, are starting to get closer to, to, to accurate. Um, we, we, don't, we don't talk about specific numbers at, at uh, this stage of development in the company, but uh, I can say sort of generally, hundreds of millions of requests per day uh, go through our API. So what do people build with it? What are, what are these kind of kinds of projects. Uh, and and I, I should mention that when I, when I first started at Twitter, my, or when I first started uh, using Twitter, my reaction um, was, was much the same as Professor Wannegrad's. It, it was, why would anyone want to use this thing? Um, what, you know, what's going to keep me coming back here? Uh, and yeah, a few months later, I was working there. So, and, and part of uh, helping me understand the value in it was using an application that looked quite a lot like this. Um, this is an application called uh, Tweety. It's actually uh, an alpha version. It's, it's not out yet. Uh, it'll be out in a few days. Um, but this sort of typifies the standard Twitter desktop client. For a lot of developers getting started with our API, something like this is the first thing they build. And you can see that it looks kind of like an instant messaging client. Uh, it shows you updates from your friends. It allows you to look at uh, replies to you, messages sent directly to you. It allows you to search. Um, Pretty straightforward, but the, uh, the ability to experiment with different modes of interaction, different themes, that kind of thing, uh, make this sort of project uh, really popular for, for our developers. Another class of applications are entirely uh, web-based. They're, they're people finding ways to use Twitter in sort of new and unexpected ways. And, and one of those that, that we were discussing over lunch is collaborating on one account. So, uh, businesses, municipalities, uh, universities in some cases, they'll have a Twitter account and there are multiple people at that organization that are um, responsible for it. They're responsible both for making updates and for uh, maintaining a public conversation with uh, people following them. So CoTweet is uh, probably the, the sort of best of breed solution for uh, people collaborating around a, a Twitter account. And we've started using it to keep up with our developers, actually. There's several of us on the API team. And uh, it's, it's been a really great way for us to answer people's questions. So if they're sitting down for a Saturday afternoon hack project and they run into some obstacle, one of us is probably in front of our laptops. And we can hop onto CoTweet and see you know, who's having problems and uh, if our coworkers have already helped that person out. Another really interesting class of applications are essentially these um, social layers or social filters on our community. Uh, this is StockTwits, which uh, is a, a real-time collaborative investment community. It's, it's people talking about you know, what stocks are hot on, on Twitter. Uh, but what's kind of interesting about it is they make you go and, and sign up for a Twitter account. 
But we've seen users that essentially never come back to our site. They just they go back to stock twits every day. That is for them the uh, the entire scope of their Twitter usage. And in that sense, the Twitter API becomes this kind of messaging layer behind the scenes. Stock twits doesn't have to build a way for people to uh, update and, and follow messages and all that. We've provided that for them. They've just focused that experience down to the investment community. Another class of projects are, are hardware hacks. Um, this is botanicals. It, um, you, you pop it in a, a potted plant, and it will tweet at you when the plant needs water. Um, <laughs> It's, it, it's pretty cool. <laughs> um, this is a Baker tweet. Um, this is for uh, bakeries, and there's, there's one in London uh, using this right now. When they're done baking a fresh batch of cupcakes, they turn the dial to cupcakes and hit a button, and it tweets on their behalf, letting their customers know that there's fresh cupcakes at this bakery in London. Um, this is, uh, I, I forget the name of the project, but uh, you might be able to guess. Uh, it tweets on behalf of a kicking uh, baby in utero. <laughs> um, so some guy uh, you know, had some, some free time on a weekend and a pregnant wife and a Twitter account, and this is what he built. Um, and this kind of on the, the green tip is a, a Twitter modification for a system called Kilowatt. And Kilowatt tells you what the power consumption in your home is, and if you're exceeding a certain uh, threshold, uh, you can have that system send you a message on Twitter and say, hey, you might want to turn off that TV or turn off your, uh, your extra hard drive at home or that kind of thing. So how does, the, how does the Twitter API feel to use? Um, this is the first experience that a lot of developers have with our API. This is what we encourage them to do. If you go and look at our API documentation, we, we walk people through a couple of basic concepts like how to authenticate and that kind of thing. And then what we say is, Go open up a terminal. Chances are pretty good that you have uh, this open source software called Curl, which is for making web requests in, in much the same way that your, your web browser does. And go and, and try some of the URLs that, that comprise our API. In this case, we're asking uh, to show information about me. Um, and you can see that we're getting that uh, information back in XML and that, for the most part, the fields are pretty predictably named. Uh, we don't tend to kind of shorten things down as programmers like to do to save a few keystrokes. We, we spell things out um, so you can see, you know, how many favorite uh, tweets I have. You can see um, the, the text of my most recent uh, update when, when I took this screenshot and that kind of thing. Uh, to make it a little bit easier to see, I'm going to throw some syntax highlighting on here. Oh, that's actually not e easy to see at all. Um, Oh, that's going to make some of the later examples hard to read. Um, <laughs> uh, at any rate, um, this is asking for uh, the status. Uh, this is asking for a particular status by its ID. Um, and this was one of my coworkers uh, tweeting about his uh, his cat badgering him to be fed. Um, and again, you, you can see everything is is very clearly and, and literally named, um, and that we have this very simple uh, nesting of the data returned. You get the status text, and then you get a user object inside it. Um, so what do people think about working with our API? Um, this is some feedback. It's pretty easy to use. Not sure what to build, but it's easy. Um, this, this one is a favorite of mine. Um, <laughs> calls are human readable and easy to understand. Facebook is a stark contrast. Um, Someone else just integrated the, the Twitter API with their, with their favorite uh, technology. Uh, again, kind of amazing that the whole set of Twitter actions are so open and easy. So this is, this is not the feedback that, that we necessarily see every day. It's the feedback we like to see. And I'm going to get into the negative stuff too. Um, but this is really what we're going for. When, when we're talking about um, the interaction design of APIs, this is the uh, initial gut response that we want. This is easy, it's discoverable, it feels natural. Um, it, so in our API, what, what makes it easy? Um, we have a really low barrier to entry. You don't need to get set up with uh, an, an SDK, a special developer kit. Yeah? So one, one view might be, heck, Twitter's such an easy service that the API intrinsically is going to be easy to use, no matter, you know, no matter what the programmers decide it ought to be. And another view is, 
there's something difficult about the design of the API that we got that we got right that was not obvious. Do you do you have a sense, or you talk about it all, which that is? Yeah, hopefully in the next couple slides, I'll give you a sense of, of what that might be. Um, so we, we've tried to maintain this very low barrier to entry. A lot of APIs, you have to get set up with a developer key, a, a bunch of software. Um, and we really encourage developers to just use the open source tools that they, that they already have on their computer to start working with the API and to really um, explore it rather than you know, reading 20 pages of documentation. Um, what we want to encourage is, is something that you can kind of guess at what the behavior is supposed to be, and it just works that way. Um, part of that is that use of human readable names, a logical nesting of resources, and, and part of this falls out of our, our choice to uh, use a, a design style called REST, and I'll get into that a little bit later. Um, we try to have very predictable output. Um, that is, you, you ask for a user, you get a user, uh, the only other possible option is that you get back an error message. Um, and we try to have a very constrained set of object models. I, I, in part, it's true Twitter is a simple system, so we can, we can represent it simply in the API. But um, we've certainly had the opportunity to um, go down some more complex roads or to, to answer developer requests for, you know, well, can you give me this slice of data or that slice of data uh, if, I, if I do A, can you give me B, but just a little bit different? Uh, and time and time and time again, we've sort of very politely tried to uh, push developers back towards no. Like, we just have this simple set of objects, and that's what people interact with. So we, we definitely haven't gotten everything right. Um, and these four points are definitely what frustrates developers the most. We now have a, a full-time uh, developer support person, and I ran this past him the other day, and he grimly nodded and said, yes, that is what frustrates developers the most. Uh, anything inconsistent, whether it's an inconsistent response, inconsistent documentation, developers like things that are rigid and predictable. Um, anything that's vague, uh, any time uh, a action could be interpreted a couple of different ways. Um, the fact that we don't provide user interface conventions. Uh, if you're a developer and you're not already a Twitter user and you're sitting down to, to do your first project, you basically have to look at the Twitter website for a while to really get a sense of, what am I supposed to do with this data? And some of the most interesting projects, I think, have been from developers that don't really go back to the Twitter site day to day. They just see the data and they have some spark of, you know, well, I can take this in a very different direction. But one of the things we really want to get better at is providing a set of, of user interface conventions and saying this is the canonical way to represent a user or to represent a status update in our system. Um, and then uh, kind of immaterial to the concerns of HCI, but network and performance issues. One of, one of the things that whether you're providing an API over the internet or you're providing an API uh, locally that, that runs off disk is that you're essentially presenting this contract to the programmers, but circumstances beyond your control may prevent you from fulfilling that contract. In our case, if our load balancer dies, then uh, people who are making API requests to us are going to see error messages that are outside of the scope of what we say they're going to, to see. Uh, similarly, if, if we were providing something that sh you know, shipped on a, on a disk, you know, someone says, well, this is this API to, to draw me uh, a polygon, but there's malware running on that user's computer, and it's consuming all the resources, and you, know, you don't actually ever get that polygon back from the API. Um, so what frustrates developers can sometimes be these sort of un unintended consequences. Um, so I want to give you a tour. Uh, now, now that I've kind of shown you a little bit about the Twitter API, I, I want to give you a tour of some bad APIs and some good APIs, and both the, the fancy new web service kind and, and the old school kind. And then we're going to look at, at good stuff, and we're going to go back to sort of what the principles of, of good API design uh, are. So this is a horrendous piece of code. Um, this is, uh, it's written in, a, in uh, the Scala language, um, but it's calling into Java libraries. Um, and one of the interesting things about Scala is that it has complete interoperability between uh, uh, or, or with, with code that, that runs on the, the JVM. Um, so what we're trying to do here is just get a date. And 
it takes us four ghastly lines of code to get back a date. Um, I, I solicited feedback uh, about a week ago uh, asking developers, what's the worst API you've ever worked with? And, and so some of these examples are, are taken from that feedback. And this one came up over and over again, Java Util Calendar and Java Util Date. Um, so in order to get back the date we want, we have to instantiate a simple date format. We have to uh, have an object that represents the concept of the format that we want the date back in. Then, um, even though we're working in an object-oriented language and conventionally we can say new object, for whatever reason, when we want a calendar, we have to say calendar.getInstance. Already we have an API that isn't predictable and indeed is kind of violating the, uh, the, the basic concepts of the, the language itself. Um, then, in order to set the date on the calendar, um, pretty predictable, you know, we, we handed some integers representing the year, the month, the day, but we have to say month minus one, because for whatever reason in this API, months are off by one. Uh, and the only way the developer is going to, to uh, figure that out is to either read the documentation in incredible detail or to find bugs in their program. And that's what I ran into. Um, so finally, we've, we take the f the, this abstract idea of the format we want our date in and we run the calendar through it only after we've gotten the time of a calendar. And if you ever actually came up to a person and said, what is the time on this calendar? They would look at you like you're crazy. So there's just, there's so much wrong in here. There, there's so much that is unpredictable. It doesn't mirror real world concepts. Um, it's inconsistent. This is essentially everything I'm, I'm trying to argue against, but I'll show you a couple of other examples. Um, yeah. Make the observation, well, maybe maybe calendars and times and the mixture thereof is it's kind of a complicated subject. It is. Anyway, so so the observation might be the critique would then be that this is relatively too complex. Yes, absolutely. Um, it, it is complicated, and it, particularly in, in the Java world, you get libraries that are enormously complicated and very frustrating to work with, but very comprehensive. Um, we spend a lot of time working with the Apache HTTP client, which has been developed for 10 years by you know, a, a multitude of developers, and it does everything you could possibly want from an HTTP client, but it's really unpleasant to use. And um, maybe that's a trade-off we have to make, and maybe it's not. Um, so an another, uh, an another example that I, I got back from many a developer was Keychain Services on, on Mac OS X. Uh, and this is all example code. That's, that's a diagram that's taken from their example code. Uh, and essentially, this is an API for uh, storing and retrieving passwords. Um, but you can see the complicated uh, workflow that they want developers to go through, all the error cases. Uh, generally, if you're having to sort of diagram out, this is how you, you as the programmer have to deal with all these exceptional cases. Um, and they're not handled internally by the API. Um, I, I would argue that you kind of haven't really fulfilled your, your role as an API designer. Uh, you should be encapsulating more of this behavior and leaving fewer questions up to the developer. Um, you can also see just how, how much code is involved. Part, I mean, part of it here is that there's a ton of commenting required because in the language uh, that they're using, there's, there's no uh, concept of, of named parameters. So a developer is forced to comment every single thing so they can remember when they come back to the code, well, this is why this parameter is in this position and this is what it means. Um, in that sense, it's an example of, of a programming language kind of doing a disservice to their, to their developers. Um, it, it's it's going to get cheerier when I get to the good APIs, don't worry. Uh, it's, not, it's not all going to be doom and gloom. Um, far and away, the, the, the number one worst API uh, pe people talk to me about was, was Win32, the, 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 or, you know, or Windows 16, or the Microsoft Foundation classes. Um, there seems to be something that Microsoft is doing in terms of API design that is upsetting many professional developers. Um, these lines of code are from a, one of the more popular tutorials on Win32 development uh, on the web. And uh, the goal, actually, can, can somebody tell me what this code is supposed to do? Just kind of looking at it. Yeah. Other than an OK cancel dialog and return go. You got it. Um, but so one, one guy got it. <laughs> there were a lot of confused people in the room. Um, this again, th this it's a simple task. 
It's a ton of code. It's not immediately obvious what it's doing. There's a lot of um, kind of you know sigils and values that that the the programmer is forced to keep track of. Um, there's there's a a lot of this that doesn't seem like it has anything to do with the programmer's goal. Um, and maybe that's not a great way to approach an API. Uh, then lastly, here's an example. Um, I, I had never looked at the Yelp API, but, some, but somebody said, take a look at this. It's, it's really frustrating. Um, this is a, a web service API that's very similar to the one that we provide at Twitter. Uh, and in this case, we're trying to get back a list of, of neighborhoods based on an address, which is a really useful service. And, and the things that the, the Yelp API does are, you, you can build really neat applications on it. But there's a bunch of stuff here that they've done that kind of defies the conventions of, of providing uh, web service APIs. Um, for one, there's no syntax highlighting on this slide because though the Yelp API is supposed to return uh, data in the JSON, the JavaScript object, object notation format, in their documentation, uh, they actually supply invalid JSON. Um, JSON doesn't use uh, single quoted strings. It uses double quoted strings. And so I popped this into my text editor and said, this is JSON syntax highlighted as such. And it marked it all in red because it was all wrong. So that's not a great kind of out of the gate experience for, for a developer. Um, there's also some kind of strange stuff going on here. That when you make an HTTP request, there's a lot of information that is carried with it and, and returned there. There's information about the state of the resource that you're trying to access and whether your request failed, in what way it failed, if you need to retry, that kind of thing. But the Yelp API kind of ignores this transport layer and says, well, we're going to return you an error code. We're going to return the, the text of the error code, which is OK. Rather than putting the version in the URL, we're going to put the version in the response data. The, the list of neighborhoods, all that stuff is fine. But the fact that they've kind of ignored the technologies that they have at their disposal and have pushed that burden onto their developers suggests that, again, they, it's, it's, not, it's not a deeply flawed API. It's just they haven't gone that extra mile to think about what the interaction is going to be for the programmer. But let's look at some APIs that have. Let's look at some really beautiful code. Um, this is an example of a, a database migration in uh, the Ruby on Rails framework. The goal here is to uh, create a table, and in the event that you need to roll back the state of your database, to provide a little bit of code that, that will then uncreate that table. Um, and you could show this to anyone. And they probably, after looking at it for a few seconds, have a pretty good idea of what's going on here. Because everything is incredibly literally named. We're creating a table. These are the columns in the table. These are the types of data in here. We're we're, after we're done with that, we're going to add an index. It's, it's beautiful declarative code for a, a, a straightforward declarative process. This is an example of uh, some code from the jQuery library. Uh, jQuery is. Uh, sort of a convenience layer on top of JavaScript. And it's become quite popular. Uh, I think actually whitehouse.gov now makes use of jQuery. Uh, it makes doing uh, advanced effects in JavaScript much easier. Uh, and generally, it's for transforming the, the state and appearance of, of a web page. Um, so in this case, again, we have something that, that's very easy to read. Uh, on, this, on the login element of this form, or so, sorry, on, on a form uh, named login, we're going to find labels, hide them. We're going to uh, put a red border around the password input. And uh, in the event that the form is submitted, we're going to pop up a confirmation dialog box. And what's kind of interesting about jQuery is that um, they've gone in this very extreme direction. Um, in some more academic programming languages, in functional programming languages, the idea of mutating state over and over again is frowned upon. You want to write programs that are predictable, um, that are easy to reason about. And the, the thought is that if you're constantly mutating state, it's difficult for the, the programmer to find bugs and, and that sort of thing. In this case, jQuery is all about mutating state. You're, you're chaining these expressions together that uh, are, are flipping around properties on a web page. And the end result is something that's, that's easy enough that um, web, web designers who don't necessarily have a strong background in, in languages other than HTML or CSS are, are able to write code like this very easily. Uh, finally, this is an example of actors in Scala. Um, 
Actors are a, uh, a mechanism for providing concurrency uh, in an application. The traditional way to do this is with threads. Uh, and, and again, threads generally have been a source of, of bugs, a source of um, developer uh, upset. Um, they're, they're a pain in the ass to work with, basically. And so the actor model is supposed to simplify this by saying, if you have some concurrent code, you model it as this object that receives messages. And when you, you want it to do something on your behalf, you just send it a message. So here we can see we're creating an actor. Uh, it loops. Inside of that loop, it receives messages. Whenever it receives a message, it prints them out. And those last two lines of code exercise that actor. And what's interesting is the choice of the, uh, the exclamation point here. So they, what the, the designers of, of this library have, have decided is that um, you know, something you're going to do over and over again when writing concurrent code is send messages to actors. So rather than having a really long method name, they're going to have this very simple representation of what it means to send a message to an actor. Um, it's just bang, it's this declaration. Um, and it's then very easy when looking at a bunch of Scala code to say where a message is being sent around. Uh, it's, it's something they borrowed um, from, from the airline programming language for the, the language geeks out there. Sorry? Oh, they do not. Uh, yeah, so, so that, that's sort of the interesting thing, is, is typically the exclamation point is, is negation. Um, it, because of the, the way um, methods are called in Scala, it's essentially, it's, it's not a problem. You can still put bang in front of something, and okay. you know, it, all, it all sort of works out. Um, but that's, that, I suppose, is, is the only thing that would be confusing where the first time you're looking at, um, at a bunch of Scala code. You might say, well, what do they mean, echo, echo actor, not hello? But you get used to it. Um, so what are the qualities of good APIs? What have we kind of seen here um, in terms of good code, bad code? Um, explorability. Uh, I think this is absolutely the, the most important thing in an API. Um, and I have kind of a case study here. Uh, earlier, I, I mentioned that our API uh, adheres to a design principle called REST. Uh, REST stands for Representational State Transfer. Um, and it's, the, the acronym is not important. Basically, it's a way of using the way the web works to represent collections of, of objects and the things you can do with them. Um, there are many, many attempts out there on the web to explain what REST is in, in detail. But to a degree, it's, it's become almost as much a, a kind of philosophy in the development of web service uh, as it has uh, a, a technology. Um, the traditional way to build web services was with a collection of <coughs> things called SOAP and XML RPC, um, these kind of complicated suites of standards. Uh, and they haven't really won in the end. Um, they, they haven't really captured the, uh, the hearts and minds of developers. And more and more APIs over time have gone in the direction of, of REST. And what's interesting is that those, those WS star technologies like SOAP actually do a lot more for the programmer. Um, the approach there is that rather than having a page of documentation with a bunch of URLs that if you access them, do things on your behalf, the, the approach in something like SOAP is that you have this uh, machine-readable definition of your API. It lists out every method, every um, bit of data that that method can return, and their types and all that. You can hand that document to a program, and it can do a bunch of work on your behalf. So you would think that this is what programmers would like at the end of the day. Programmers are kind of lazy. Um, but it turns out that people actually like exploring their APIs. They like having this kind of hands-on um, approach to the technologies that they're working with because it gets them acquainted with, um, with the whole conceptual model of this other system that is not theirs. Um, in the case of, of something like SOAP and the WS star technologies, when you work with them for a while, there's never this sense of you've completely grasped how this, how this other thing off in the cloud works. It's there, and it's doing things on your behalf. But the whole idea is that the, de the details are kind of hidden away from you. And in my experience, programmers don't like having the details hidden away from them. They, they like knowing the nitty gritty, because eventually, some detail is going to bite you in the ass, and you're going to want to be able to, to correct it. Yeah? What do you do about uh, I guess uh, my question is about your use of like the word explorable. 
what do you do about um, the groups of developers who are just trying to get something done? Mm -hmm. And because um, I feel like there's a lot of different types of developers, and so those that don't want to explore, they just want to get their job done. So, in, in the case of the the Twitter API community, what's happened is that um, certain developers build. Uh, applications like like the ones I showed you earlier, and others maintain libraries for their uh, favorite language or platform. So we have developers who've written um, Twitter libraries for Ruby, uh, PHP, Python, you name it. And for the developers who want to just get started quickly, they don't really want to have to learn all the URLs, all the intricacies of our of our API uh, firsthand. They can use those libraries for their language or platform. Um, it. It, it basically just seems to be a function of a developer ecosystem that some people like building tools for other developers and some people like building tools for users. Um, and for the most part, we haven't, we haven't really had to encourage people to come along and build those libraries for those languages. People do it for fun. Uh, it, it, usually they, they build it because they have uh, some product built on our API and they want you know, an easier and more consistent way to interact with it. But that's, that's been the, the kind of pragmatic solution. Um, in terms of explorability, this is a slightly more visual example. Um, this, these are a couple of screenshots of different versions on different platforms of the, of the Smalltalk environment. Uh, Smalltalk never really took off as a programming language, but in terms of providing an uh, explorable uh, model to developers, one that you can type in some code, you can browse documentation for that code very easily, uh, you can see cause and effect in a very short period of time. Um, it was enormously effective, and if you go back to um, some of the papers Alan Kay wrote about it, he, he was able to you know, get children 10, 11, 12 building impressive graphical programs um, with, the, with this kind of explorable environment. Um, another slightly less user-friendly approach is um, SLIME, the superior list interaction mode for Emacs. Um, and again, the, the idea here is that you're, you're writing code, you're trying it out, you're seeing the results uh, in line. I, I really wish these screenshots were a bit more readable because you can see the, the developer is kind of sketching out code and seeing what the, uh, what the resulting behavior is. And uh, as the writer Neil, Neil Stevenson has said, uh, Lisp is the only language that can be considered beautiful. And there is something kind of beautiful about rather than reading pages and pages of documentation, just sitting down, sketching out, seeing what the results are. Um, it's, it's a very specific kind of school of programming, but it's one that, for certain types of projects, produces great results. Predictability is another quality that we're looking for in APIs. Um, a case here is uh, ODBC, JDBC. Uh, essentially, some, quite some time ago, people decided that there's a million different database systems out there in the world and we need one predictable way to interact with them. Uh, and now in the form of the various um, DBCs, uh, we have them. It doesn't really matter whether you're talking to MySQL or Postgres or Oracle. Uh, if you want to use special features of those database systems, maybe you need to get fancy. But for the most part, you can conceive of interacting with a database in this very predictable way. You get back you know, result sets full of rows and that kind of thing. Another example here um, is the system called Hackity Hack, which is uh, an educational tool. Uh, for, it's, for, it's for teaching kids how to program, basically. It's a layer on top of Ruby, um, and it's supposed to make programming fun, easy. And you can see uh, the, the kind of code that they're encouraging people to write. Uh, just says, ask for, for a name. Say that your name is this. Um, it's very easy to predict what the outcome of this code is going to be, and that gets um, stu you know, early students to programming um, involved because they don't, they don't have to, to say, well, what's going to really happen when I hit the Enter key? You can kind of just guess at what it's going to do. Um, professional programmers don't really have that sense of, of trust in their code, uh, that, that sense of predictability. That's why we write unit tests and integration tests and functional tests. We can't really rely on what our code is going to do in part because the APIs we use are unpredictable. Consistency. Um, if, if predictability is sort of the, uh, 
the thing that, that, that gives us trust in our code. Consistency is the, the aspect that gives us trust in it constantly. It's, it's what keeps us uh, assured that the next line of code we're going to write is going to work the way we think it is. Um, and a case study here is uh, the options hash in Rails. It's kind of a, a minor detail of, of this web framework. But what we can see in all these methods in, in uh, the Rails framework is that at the end of it, they all take a hash, that is a, a dictionary of keys and values, um, after the first couple of, of things that that method needs. So when you're working with Rails, you kind of, uh, after a few days, ha can just sort of guess at the, the, the way to get the behavior out of the program that you want. You can say for a lot of these bits of code that build parts of a, a form on the, on the web that you can probably stick some more values on the end and assign a new CSS class to it, or you know, change the, the width and height of an element, or, or that kind of thing. Um, it's just this, this pattern in the code base that has made it extremely accessible to developers. So that, in a nutshell, is what I'm advocating. It's, it's the humane API. It's an API that is explorable, it's predictable, it's consistent. It gives us a sense of confidence in our tools. It gives us a sense that the tools that we're using are uh, beautiful and that with them we can create beautiful things. And what we're, what we're going to attempt to do later this year with the Twitter API is really clean up the inconsistencies, clean up b behaviors that, um, that make our API unpredictable, take maximum advantage of uh, a restful design practice um, to really group the, uh, the resources that we have very logically so that you're essentially always uh, putting items into collections of RESTful resources, finding items, taking them out. Um, just this very simple uh, mental model of how to interact with our service. Um, so that's it. And I hope you guys have tons of questions. <laughs> Thank you very much. Humane, it was humane programming. Is that consistent with that, or is that your own invention? Uh, this, this was just a, a turn of phrase for this slide. <laughs> so, um, when the Java API first came out, it was one of the nicer APIs in terms of programming language. But over, over years, it just became the biggest hairy mess you can imagine as they kept on adding more and more stuff onto it. Mm -hmm. so, one of the problems that I see is that basically that it's easy to have a simple API when you start, but how do you actually manage the evolution of that API in order to... You know, the question is, like, when you add groups or when you add other features onto Twitter at some point in the future, mm -hmm. what, how, what, what, do you, what do you want to try and do? Uh, in our case, again, we're, we're able to come back to those RESTful design principles and say, if we add a new resource in our system, we know how to represent that resource. Uh, some APIs and some platforms don't have that, that crutch to fall on. Uh, they, they essentially, you know, sky's the limit in terms of how they want to represent the objects in their system. So they, they, I think, need to come up with a set of design practices at the outset and really try to stick to them. Um, I think there's another question along those lines. I find this very interesting because I was in computing long enough ago that I was, I grew out of a Lisp culture. I think Lisp was beautiful. I agree with that. But that there was a real sense that, well, put it in a phrase, you're going to give me an API which forces me to transmit a whole bunch of extra characters so people can read it when it's actually machines reading it. Right. Furthermore, I'm going to have to run a parser on what comes in. It's not going to be packed into byte fields that I can just use. Right. Furthermore, you're going to give me the whole thing every time I ask you for any little detail. I mean, I could just have any detail. Those are all crazy waste of resources. Yes compared to a streamline. And what you're saying, I mean, the obvious point is that in today's environment, the resources are cheap enough for the scale you have mm -hmm. that you're just taking one side of the trade-off space and saying, this is the right principle. But as you scale, some of those things become different. And complexity of the thing you're returning becomes one of them. If every, you know, <coughs> imagine your fantasy, not just every person in the world is Twitters. Mm -hmm. Every flower pot, every <laughs> electrical <laughs> plug, every, yeah. you know, now your, your scale is very different. And then efficiency might actually be relevant. Exactly, yeah. At, at, at that point, it doesn't make sense to hand around a, a K of XML to describe every tweet from a flower pot. Um, I, th I think at that point, we do have to look at those 
more kind of rigid technologies. W one of the things that, that we've been experimenting with uh, on the, the back end of our system that, that users don't interact with is uh, Thrift, which is uh, Facebook's way of, of moving, you know, very compact data around it. It's, it's basically sort of Google's protocol buffers plus or minus some, some features. Um, and we've had some interest from developers who uh, make many, many requests to our system every day that we expose our API uh, via Thrift as well as via you know, these, these kind of RESTful web services. And I think that that's something, that's something we might do, but uh, we definitely wouldn't, or we would caution uh, novice developers to the Twitter API not to go down the Thrift route from day one. You know, sort of understand, um, understand the, the, the big bloated version first um, because you really get a sense of, of what we're trying to do and then, you know, go for efficiency. So I, I think it's possible to do both. Sure. So kind of going, creeping up and going back to your, your three criteria, one, one, perhaps a fourth one, or at least another dimension to it might be utility mm -hmm. in some sense to, to really set up the big constraint, the big trade-offs. Yes. Absolutely. Uh, and, and maybe one, one sort of part of the critique is in, our, in our minds as well as a bit in your presentation has been a mixture of critique at kind of what, what would be called the lexical level in programming languages and, and the, more, the more semantic level. Mm -hmm. uh, do, you, do you think that there's, there's a good clean way of, of making, making a, a bifurcating critique that, that can really uh, sort of Put, put the lexical issues in their place, and then, at least to my mind, concentrate on the really hard semantic ones to get a notion of what, what clarity is and what's implicit, how your criteria apply there. Yeah, I, I, th I think definitely in a, long, in a longer format, in a, you know, in a, in a proper kind of research paper approach, we, we could absolutely do that. Um, this, this is really a mix of, you know, what what works well and doesn't work well and what feels right and what doesn't feel right. So, so some of it is, you know, it's, it's very clear that you can demonstrate this isn't efficient code. This takes too many lines for a developer to accomplish their goal. And some of it is just what, um, what developers call code smells. It's just, you know, they, they encounter some, some block of code and for whatever reason it rubs them the wrong way and they, they don't want to interact with those libraries. Um, I think, I think a, a formalization of, of this kind of stuff would be really useful. <laughs> but it's not, um, it, it's something I'd, I'd love to do. Uh, give me about two years. <laughs> yeah. So it seems like one barrier to entry for a lot of APIs is you have to register, you have to do all your calls with an API key, and whatever security has been, you know, come up with around that. Yeah. That's how you've gotten around. What are the trade offs that you've seen in terms of API abuse or? So you, there, there's quite a lot that you can do unauthenticated with the Twitter API. Some of our methods do require authentication, and we've used uh, HTTP basic authentication for a while. Um, and one of the issues that uh, has come up in the tech press from time to time has been our, our use of HTTP basic auth because uh, some people feel that the kind of the security story around it uh, is not ideal. And so we've, we've um, added a, a technology called OAuth is a, an, an open standard for doing token authentication. And the nice thing now is that uh, sites that uh, interact with Twitter where you, know, you, you visit that site, you want to link it to your Twitter account, um, we have uh, a very clear way to do that in a secure way such that those sites aren't storing Twitter usernames and passwords. The downside has been the complexity for developers. Uh, working with OAuth is not easy, and working with other token, system, token authentication systems is not easy. Um, I think that the trade-off is going to be uh, how do we get more developers using this more secure authentication system um, and getting them over the, the usability <coughs> hurdle of that API. Um, and we thought about trying to you know, come up with our own way of doing this as, that was a little bit simpler, a little bit more Twittery, but um, adhering to an open standard is ultimately sort of what our community wanted us to do. So. So I don't know if I have a clean question, but uh, at least I'd, I'd like you to comment a little bit more on, on the observation that you made that the, you know, the WS star services where you just import some, some package into your development environment and, and it builds a wrapper for the service in your programming language mm -hmm. of choice, stands on one side and then you have the RESTful service on the other side. And it seems that with many of those, as you said, users in the community just happen to contrib contribute wrappers in any given programming Actually, multiple implementations in any given programming language. Uh, 
Yeah. And in the beginning, I was afraid of, well, but now I have to tr trust this other person's code, how they construct the libraries. But somehow, it's always been OK. And, and I wonder, this is something that countered my own intuition. And I wondered if, if you could comment on that. It's, it's, it's been really surprising. Um, it's been amazing to me that, that developers will spend their time building you know, libraries for our libraries. Um, I, I think part of it is that so one, one part of the tech industry, we, we were talking about Microsoft a bit o o over lunch and how they, they never deprecate any, anything. And sort of one philosophy in the tech industry is that you have this never-ending contract with your users and developers, and you're always going to support everything. And I think the, the uh, RESTful perspective is one that's kind of caught up to speed with the internet, with the web, with the social web. It's that, you know, it's act and, and with the open source movement, too. It's, you know, it's not that hard to keep up with changes to a project. It's, it's easy to be alerted to changes to a project. It's easy to push out new code. It's easy for people to contribute to those libraries. So we don't necessarily need those long-standing contracts anymore. Um, things are flexible enough that it's kind of a solved problem. Um, I'm a generally a visual thinker, and I've always um, imagined APIs as a vanishing of sorts. And if all 40 of your methods were laid out, <coughs> Vending machine, you know, I could scan it visually, explore it, mm -hmm. poke at it, and with a certain amount of transparency, I know what I'm getting. Yeah. Um, and I, and I, I guess in general, programmers <coughs> be comfortable creating a mental model that's text-based. So, have you ever come across beautiful visualizations of APIs? I mean, there's tons of talk of user interfaces, but what about visual API? That's that's pretty rare. I mean, the the best that that some services do is a kind of. Um, it, it, like in browser API console, where they give you a list of the methods that are available, and uh, you know you click on them and you get some sample data back. Uh, Google actually did a nice uh, test console for for OAuth for this token authentication system, so you can sort of play with that in your browser a little bit. But I've not seen beautiful visualizations of APIs um, to the extent that you see. Um, it's like there are really nice animations that demonstrate various sorting algorithms. Uh, I, I've never seen anyone kind of do that for APIs, and that, that'd be wonderful to see. Yeah, yes. comment on the last one. I, I basically use LabVIEW, misuse LabVIEW for that purpose, because it's basically graphic language. It's sort of more hardware-oriented. So for people have a hardware-oriented intuition, that may work, but it's certainly mi misused. Yeah. Anyway, just at least one environment you can play with. Other questions? Yes. Uh, your question on the non-API topic. Sure. Okay. Um, there's been a lot of talk about uh, how URLs are handled and short URLs, etc. Yeah. Um, and I'm just wondering what reasons Twitter would have to not have its own URL shortening service, or better yet, to not actually count the length of a URL in a Twitter message. We um, we don't have a good reason, which is why <laughs> what we do with uh, with URLs is going to change. So <laughs> I, I, I think that's pretty much all I can say. I, I wish I could say more. But, but yeah, we're, we, we've, we've been really frustrated by, by the way um, passing URLs around in, on our service works. And we're going to try to improve it in a couple of different ways, both from kind of a, the, the web-facing you know, UI model and from the developer perspective. So sure. Other questions? Um, with the use of Twitter, basically exploding right now. Have you run into any interesting or <coughs> unexpected challenges with API design? Um, unexpected challenges. I, one, of, one of the strangest things, actually, is that for, for the most part, the people that build the most interesting stuff on the API bug us the least. And, and this, this totally baffles me. But um, the, the developer of, of Tweety, which is right, right now the most popular iPhone client for, for Twitter, came into our office several weeks ago. And we sat down and said, you know, so what can we do for you? You've, you've you know, shipped you know, hundreds of thousands of copies of, of this software. And you've really helped Twitter grow. You know, what, is there a feature you'd like to see in the API? And he's pretty much like, I'm good. Just doing, <laughs> just doing my thing. <laughs> he, he, he asked for you know one additional parameter on a method that, it, that as it so happened, we had already shipped a couple of days previous. And he's like, great, no, I'm, I'm, I'm set. <laughs> and, and the developers that have been most frustrated about our APIs that 
you know, they, they, they sit down and, and they send us some scathing email to our developer list saying, you know, this is completely unusable and, and X, Y, and Z. Generally, what, once we walk them through um, the, the questions that they have, the concerns that they have, and they, they take a few weeks and, and they build something, they're, they're not, they're, their apps aren't as interesting. Um, the, 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 biggest, the biggest challenge is basically just providing uh, an API uh, while the back end of our service is struggling to keep up with demand. Um, and I, I sort of straddle the line between interacting with developers and uh, interacting with the rest of our engineers and kind of figuring out what we, what we can deliver realistically. Um, and that's, uh, it's, it's frustrating. I, but half the time I, I want to sort of stop working on developer facing projects for a while and just go in and improve the efficiency of the system so that uh, people get their responses back faster and that kind of thing. So. Do you do any bandwidth limiting? I mean, if I write an app that, you know, just makes a million yes. calls a second to you, do you still have some way of shutting it off? Yes, we do. We, we do. We do rate limiting. So, uh, by default, you get uh, 100 authenticated and 100 unauthenticated requests per hour per IP. So, the, the idea is that if a user is using a, a Twitter app on their phone and then they you know, go home to their computer, that they're not penalized for making requests on those two different devices. Um, but for developers, 100 requests an hour generally isn't enough, which is why we have um, a handy form where you can go and request whitelisting, and then we bump up the limit per hour. Um, so most developers are on the whitelist. We have you know, thousands and thousands of people on the whitelist. And then for, for certain applications that could consume just a terrifying number of resources. We have them on an even higher tier. Um, but, but for a while, we had no constraints on, on use, and that, that didn't work. Um, what we found right now is that every time we add more capacity, be it another load balancer, uh, another collection of servers, as soon as that capacity goes online, it's in use. Uh, essentially, Twitter right now is a nightclub that's turning people away at the door, and the only way you can get in is if someone decides to leave. So <laughs> that's that's frustrating. I'm I'm hoping that that in a in a few months we can be kind of ahead of the of that capacity planning and not just keeping up with it. But we're gonna have to not be on Oprah in order for that to happen. <laughs> yes. Uh, so uh, the way I understand it, your API right now is very good for building basic client software in the sense of like I am you know one user I want to get my tweets or my friends mm -hmm. and so on uh, but there's this kind of second question is it becomes very popular and important of analytics yes and the idea of sort of I am a small company or even a large one uh, but even like you know let's say I develop a small piece uh, of indie software or something and I have a reasonable base of customers I want to know what are they thinking what are they talking about mm -hmm. in terms of my products uh, to what extent is the API available for sort of large-scale searches and, you know, live ones or, or near-live ones for arbitrary terms. So we have a much higher rate limit on our search API, um, it, in part um, due to some, some efficiencies in caching logic and the, there. We, we, we can allow people to, to hit it a little bit harder than, than the main API. So a lot of businesses have found that that today is, is pretty much meeting their needs in terms of keeping up with conversations about uh, their, their brand, their product, whatever. Um, we're just experimenting with uh, a new addition to the API, a streaming API. Uh, right now we have, we have one site consuming from it. Um, but right, right now it pushes the entire stream of all public tweets all the time to this other service that um, makes use of that, that corpus. Um, we've also had a, a data mining feed, which is not, uh, it's not push-based, it's pull-based. Um, but that, that returns a kind of large random sample uh, once a minute of, of public tweets for people doing uh, natural language processing experiments and that kind of thing. And I, I think last I checked, we had about 100 different people at various universities and such who are, who are consuming that. Uh, we've also allowed the distribution of large sets of, of public updates via BitTorrent. Like somebody essentially collected tweets via the data mining feed for a month, packaged them up, um, put some indexes on them, and we said, sure, if you want to share that with other academics via BitTorrent, go for it. Um, so we're, we're trying to encourage, particularly in the research space, that kind of massive scale use of, of the API. And um, what, I'm, 
what I'm hoping we can do is deliver a streaming API that if people are interested in updates from sets of users, or from specific sets of users, be they someone from, from a particular location or an organization, or if they're interested in tweets about specific topics, that we can push those to them rather than, than you know, they have to constantly come and ask our servers, do you have new information? Um, and we've, we've developed some, some uh, new technology for that, and so far it seems to be performing pretty well. Yes. A Twitter-specific question. Do, do, you, do you have, uh, or what, 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 no, what types of, of user models do you have? Personas, graphic, graphic level, or, or, or t touching on the metric, which is less interesting? We, we haven't been in the position to have user models. <laughs> our, 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 I think a lot of people uh, think that because we're, you, uh, as you, you were mentioning, Earlier, you know, we're we're mentioned in the same breath as Yahoo and and Facebook and LinkedIn and these very large organizations. We're 35 people, and a number of those people have only started in the last couple of weeks. Um, for for the majority of the life of, of the company, we've been you know less than 10, less than 20 people. Um, so we we haven't had anyone on staff to do things like you know do user models, do proper you know kind of Google style A/B test, absolutely every color, every button kind of stuff. Um, we've kind of been winging it. <laughs> um, so uh, we, we were talking about this a, uh, a little bit before, but the way we've generally tested uh, new features or kind of tested new user experiences is that we ask people on Twitter. Um, we, we roll out something to all of our users or a handful of users, and then we just ask them for feedback and, and collect that feedback um, in, in a very unscientific way. Um, I think as our organization grows, we'll probably get into uh, uh, approaching our user experience in, in a much more uh, formalized way. But for now, it's, it's been very haphazard. Do you, just in terms of your own personal subjective opinion, do you, do you feel as though there are classes of, of users that are kind of a broad Gaussian sort of, yeah, there, especially with desktop versus mobile? Say. Yeah, there, there, are, there are widely different kind of update patterns, consumption patterns. Um, we, do, we do have a, a chief scientist, and he has run some numbers on you know, what's sort of the long tail of our community, how many people do most people follow, that kind of thing. And we've, we've, found, we've found definite patterns. I can't necessarily share what those patterns are, but we, we, but we have found uh, distinct user models. Um, what I've seen uh, personally what, watching friends, family members use the service over the course of a year or two is that they start out uh, interacting principally with the website, then they experiment with mobile for a while, then eventually they kind of set, settle into this balance where they catch up on the web, um, they keep up using an API client, and they update when they're out and about on a phone. Um, so it, it becomes integrated into different um, activities uh, in different ways. So, um, so we talked about kind of this <laughs> developer side of the API, but the API also has a huge impact on what you identified on the scalability side. Yes. Right. So have you, what, what changes in any, or what have you considered in the API from in terms of actually improving the scalability? We've had to, we've had to kind of uh, force developers to drop certain parameters, different ways they were filtering down their requests. Um, as the, the, the folks who work on the back end of our services have said, essentially we can't support these types of queries. Um, so for example, we previously allowed people to say, give me everything since this particular date within a, a range of 24 hours, and uh, now we don't. Um, we, we allow people to say, give me everything since this ID, but essentially you have to uh, have previous knowledge of what the range of IDs is in order for that to be useful. But doing that date search just wasn't scalable for us for, for the time being. It's something hopefully we can go back in and add later. But that's that's the, the kind of thing we've had to deal with over the last couple of years. Just, you know, uh, our, our databases have a certain working set in memory, and certain types of queries don't fit that profile and that, that kind of thing. Yes? Um, what, is, um, what is your opinion about uh, this uh, challenge of this Hollywood kid actor right now with uh, Larry King? And so, uh, to Twitter, what is your uh, relationship of your company to the digital media? 
Um, what is what is my relationship with? No, no your company is now you're going to bring down all the traditional media. I mean, by everybody will use. It. <laughs> <laughs> What's your opinion? About that? <laughs> I have, I don't know that I have an opinion about that. That's why I like working on the developer side of stuff. I I, I, I like I like seeing the neat the, the neat kind of unexpected uses of our service. Um, I, I think definitely, it it seems that we we we've actively tried to sort of take leaderboards out of our system. We, we've tried to take the, the parts of the site where, that, that people turn into a game out so that they, they really focus on just communicating and, and talking to other people and listening to other people. But people still love playing games with social networks and you know, having the most friends and having the most followers and all that. And it's, it's a fad right now and it'll kind of move on. But I, I think the, the thing that's that hopefully will keep people interested in our system are those unexpected uses that you know the baker in London uh, tweeting about their their fresh cupcakes and that kind of thing. It, what what I would personally like to see is that is that Twitter kind of settles into the background of people's daily lives and it settles into the background of the web. That essentially we we put out tap roots and that you're interacting with Twitter in these very unobtrusive ways. It's, it's, an, it's an ambient source of, of information in, in your life. I, I don't want people to be spending their entire lives engrossed in the culture of Twitter. I, I want them to go out and build real culture, <laughs> you know? So that, that's, that's my personal opinion. <laughs> yes? So as you try to monetize the service, how is the fact that most users access the service through the API clients uh, affect that? Um, the the initial uh, sort of uh, monetizable offering that we're planning on making this year that we have commented on on publicly is uh, the idea of verified accounts. We we have a lot of people wondering if I go and look at Whole Foods on Twitter, is that really the grocery store? If I look at Comcast, if I looked at at you know the celebrity, is that really the who they say they are? In part because um, we don't have this this rigid concept of identity, is some, something we were talking about earlier. Um, so verified accounts fit very naturally in our API. It's essentially just another attribute. When you go and retrieve information about a user, you'll see a little bully and you know, is this, is this user verified or not? And developers can choose to uh, you know, decorate the representation of that user and their client with a little you know, verified badge or, or however um, we decide to, to present it or they decide to pr present it. Um, down the road, the, both the API and the fact that, that we provide our service via SMS really constrain new features. Uh, there's been a bunch of things that we've been just about to, to get excited about and then we think, well, how is this going to fit in for a, a user who has an ancient cell phone and only ever, use Twitter, only ever uses Twitter via SMS? Um, it's, it's one of the challenges of, of working on the service. I mean, uh, there, there's, not, there's not an easy answer for it. Um, Yeah. A little detail. Somehow you set the initial length for messages. Having had experience now, is that too short, too long, or did you just accidentally hear right? Well, it, w it was initially, initially we, we were at the 160 limit that, that um, the SMS standard uh, suggests, but we needed some room for usernames at the front so that when you get a message, you can see that it's you know, from Bob Cullen and then the, the, the contents of the tweet. So we, that we cut it down to 140. It gives us a little bit more room. Um, it, it seems like it's worked pretty well. People have been able to express um, all sorts of interesting sentiments in there. Actually, there, I think there's more than one book coming out later this year of um, Twitticisms of, <laughs> the, of you know, various interesting comments people have made. Um, so it, it, it seems to be, it, it, it's a completely artificial constraint, but it, but it keeps people interested. Like haiku. Yeah, exactly. actually there, there, there are several different um, Twitter haiku monitoring bots. Uh, so some of them are, are people sort of anonymous, anonymously posting haiku, and some of them even attempt to discover inadvertent haiku in tweets. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes. Um, so one of the things that's been happening a lot recently is just, um, big growth with Twitter and people who maybe, there's a lot of us here perhaps who are early adopters, but it's becoming a lot more mainstream. And so just thinking about some of the consequences of that, there's kind of social consequences personally of, oh, now all these people want to follow me, or this privacy model doesn't allow for that. But thinking on the API side and for developers, have you seen any kind of pattern in how uh, as Twitter goes mainstream, you're getting this explosive growth. Are 
are there some differences in how people are adopting third-party tools or just using the website yeah. um, or just using the mobile version as really this is starting to explode? <coughs> yeah, I mean, frustratingly, one of the things we've seen is that uh, it, the, the first few Twitter clients that were made were really quite, quite lovely. They, they had great interaction designs, like Twitterific on the Mac, which is what a lot of people have been using for, for a while. At this point, it's kind of showing its age, but at the time that it came out, it just looked great and it worked great. Um, now, the, some of the more popular clients on the desktop are appealing to, uh, I think, an audience of, of, um, of computer users that don't have uh, the same appreciation for design. Uh, I, I think part of that is just breaking out into kind of the the Windows ecosystem a little bit, where people people care a lot about having lots of functionality, but design is not principle. Uh, <laughs> you're, you're laughing, but come on, you know what I'm saying, right? <laughs> um, so that's 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 been kind of interesting. Um, People now are going for apps that show you a ton of data. You know, the, one of the really popular ones is TweetDeck. And rather than being this nice single column view of what's going on Twitter, it, it's multiple columns. And you can set up tons and tons of searches and, and set it up so that it takes up a whole computer monitor. And we've walked into people's offices who are using that to keep up with their, their brands or, or whatever. And um, it's, a, it's a very powerful tool, but uh, it's not it's not as simple as, as Twitter is, I guess. Um, in, in kind, we, we've seen an influx of developers on, you know, on .NET, more Java developers, more of the kind of mainstream languages uh, getting interested in our API, whereas previously it was mostly web developers, Mac developers, the occasional Linux, you know, GTK developer. Um, th does, that, does that answer your question at all? Yeah, a bit. One, one additional question might be, how has, I guess, there's, so there's some growth of the number of users of Twitter and how often they're using Twitter. And then there's growth of the number of unique IPs that you're seeing using your API via client uh, applications or you know, what, however you're, you're tracking that as well. And I'm just wondering if maybe uh, a lot of the mainstream growth is going to come in more through your website or if really the entry point, the however people are, are getting introduced to Twitter is ending up being through these uh, third-party applications. So it's obviously, as has been mentioned, this does bear on monetization and mm -hmm. a lot of other things. Well, right now, their, their entry point can't be through a third-party application because we don't have a sign-up API. You can't actually download a copy of something like, like Tweety onto your iPhone um, w unless you already have a Twitter account. Yeah, you have to open up a browser. It's really cumbersome. It's, it's a problem we're going to solve. It's basically just that until we had OAuth, we didn't have a mechanism in the API to verify applications and, and trust them and give them the ability to programmatically create accounts. Uh, if, if we had released that API feature without any sort of verification, we'd have millions more spam accounts than we already contend with. Um, so hopefully, we'll, we will see more people signing up through uh, clients. But right now, by necessity, you either have to sign up via uh, SMS or sign up on the web. So that is definitely people's first introduction. Uh, what we've tried to do is let people know in the sidebar of our site about various uh, clients and, and Twitter-powered services that they might want to use. And we're going to build a, a directory of applications, not, not an app store, but essentially just, you know, I, I, have this, I have a Mac at home or I have a BlackBerry, what's the best Twitter client to use, that kind of thing. Um, I think, in a way, the fact that the, the website is the main entry point gives us some uh, control over over their their first experience like now that we're we're really trying to expose our users to our search product and to the fact that we have this view of of trending discussions around the world um, we can do that on the website when you sign up we can show them you know look you can search for uh, movie reviews you can search for people in your in your neighborhood you can search for this and that um, whereas on a on a client unless we have specifically instructed the developer to build it in a particular way, they might, have, they might take a very different slice of our, of our data and show it to users. So. With respect to, since you mentioned sort of a weak form of authorization, have you seen any unique forms of abuse, particularly around like misrepresentation? I guess you might call it twishing or something. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, we, we've seen We've seen a number of people create accounts on, on behalf of 
um, celebrities and that kind of thing. Recently, someone had created a, an account for Christopher Walken and was doing the best Christopher Walken impression you could possibly do via Twitter. <laughs> and we were all really disappointed to find out that it wasn't the actor. <laughs> um, so in, and similarly, we, we had people creating accounts. Um, Dalai Lama. Yeah, the, the Dalai Lama. And, and oftentimes, they're not malicious. They're not trying to slander the celebrity that they're representing. They're actually just fans who are, who are trying to give this person a presence on, on this new communications medium. Um, we had someone who would create an account, uh, CNN BRK, a breaking news on CNN, and just a couple of days, days ago, he actually sold it to CNN, but only after running it for the last two years, and it was one of the most popular accounts on the system. Um, and so he had no relationship with CNN. He wasn't a CNN employee. He essentially just looked a few times a day at CNN, uh, at their website, um, or, or the TV, I suppose, um, and typed updates about what was going on in the world. And you know, hundreds of thousands of people were following this account because it, it was a great resource, but it was just some dude. Um, <laughs> now, now it's official. Um, but so in some cases, the, that weak form of identity has actually shown organizations, um, this is how you might want to use this product. Someone's already doing it for you for your company. So maybe you want to get in touch with them and see if you can work something out. Uh, we we see a lot of um, we see a lot of sketchy stuff. There's you know there, there, there's a lot of pornography. People people tried in, in their early days to um, game uh, their Google ranking until we rel equals no followed all the links in there. Um, there's you know there's there's sketchy stuff. Um, last last weekend we had an outbreak of of worms. Um, people were trying to uh, you know. Re repost a link to some website and that sort of thing, and you know, affected a couple hundred accounts. Cleaned it up in, a, in an afternoon. It's it's frustrating, but you know, stay, I, I, nothing nothing particularly unusual. But, uh, having come from kind of an information security background, there hasn't been any attack on Twitter yet that that's really surprised me. So, yes. Uh, do you think Twitter would be like as popular as it is right now if, uh, or, you know, would it have grown so quickly if there wasn't such an open API? Like, what was the role of the API in uh, making it grow so quickly? Give it a lot of the credit, or just do you think it would have happened without it? I I give it some of the credit. Uh, the the most personal example I have is that when I had had first started working for the company, I was of course showing it to my parents, and showed the website to my mom and she sort of said, yeah, okay, this is kind of interesting, I get it. Um, and then about a week later, uh, I sent her a link to Twitterific and then had her download it. And when she used Twitterific and it felt more like a chat client and something that, that integrated a bit more into her, uh, her use of her Mac at home, she, she really got it, like Twitter really clicked for her. Um, so the, the Maybe the, it's, it's not so much the API itself, but just the, the API enabling people to um, uh, develop different user experiences for us and, and present Twitter in ways that, that some users might connect with more readily than, than the experience that we've come up with. Um, I, I think that's really helped. Uh, I mean, in terms of just overall traffic, uh, absolutely the API is, is responsible for that. I mean, it's like well over 90% of all the traffic we do is API requests. It's just it's just a staggering portion of it. And a lot of those are, you know, badges on, on websites, that sort of thing. Um, and that's really taken Twitter kind of out to the, the edges of the network, which is something that uh, other social networks until recently weren't as, as interested in doing. They, they wanted everyone to come to them. And, and we sort of said, no, we'll, we'll bring Twitter to you. Uh, and that kind of, that, that more open approach definitely seems to connect. Okay, that seems you. like a good ending point. Thanks. <laughs>